Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everybody. My name is Nicola, and I'm an energy data officer at the IA in charge of call annual statistics for questionnaire countries, among the other things, with my colleagues Mark and Sedu, who you will get to know later because they will present the exercises session. Now, it's up to me to guide you through this first of our fuel statistics presentation that is focused on coal and coal products. And as you uh, have seen before, explained by Margarita, for question, we will have some time at the end of this uh, presentation. So let's start by looking at some of the latest trends in uh, uh, the coal sector. And after that, I will show you all the products, flows, and definition in our data collection methodology. And finally, we will see also the annual questionnaire and some tables more in details. Uh, here you have two donut charts. The one on the left, <coughs> it's showing, sorry, the world total energy supply, and the one on the right, the world electricity generation, both for 2020. Now, an important thing here to notice is that coal is a major player in both of them. On the world total energy supply, it is the second largest source um, after oil and just in front of uh, natural gas. Instead, in terms of the electricity mix worldwide, coal is by far the first source, again, in front of uh, natural gas. Uh, I will show in the following slide some charts that have been extracted by one of our publication, Coal Information 2022, which is a yearly publication that reports the latest and historical figures about coal production, consumption, and trade. Here you see coal production from 1978 up to projection in 2021. As you can see, the trend has been increasing in the 80s, then flat in the 90s, then a steep increase in the 2000s following the big increase of what became the main producer in, uh, in the 2000s, which is China. And then again, uh, a bit of a bumpy road in the 2010s, going down, then up again, and then we had COVID and uh, the rebound. Um, the biggest producer is China, which amounts uh, for about half of the global production, followed by two other developing countries as India and uh, Indonesia, whereas OECD, countries as an aggregate are the second biggest producer worldwide and USA and Australia. Uh, sorry, I hear uh, my voice. So I kindly ask, thank you very much to close all your microphone. Thank you. So um, you, uh, the OECD, I was saying it's the second uh, biggest producer as an aggregate with the USA and Australia being important uh, producer of coal, whether for uh, the EU, uh, there is a rather small production. Then uh, we have uh, consumption in this uh, chart, which follows what is production. And uh, we have a similar historical trend with, uh, 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 sorry, I again ask all the participants to close the microphone, please. Um, so China, it's uh, this time as more than 50% of world total uh, consumption of coal. And together with India, it's about two-thirds of the world uh, uh, demand, followed by uh, US and OECD again at the second place, with the EU a bit upper in, uh, in the classification. So also EU being um, an important consumer in this case. As you can see in this graph, let me magnify it here. You see that uh, consumption decreased a little bit in 2020. That's because of the pandemic, and it has an increase about 6% overall in 2021. So let's look at this increase uh, more uh, in details. And we notice in gray that China accounted for almost half of the world increase in coal consumption in 2021, followed by India, and then also advanced economies as the United States in light uh, green and the European Union. Now, what are the causes? of uh, this increase in 2021, of course, is the rebound from uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, so an increase in economic and industrial activities, but also the fact that uh, coal reaffirmed itself in 2021 as a very cheap and reliable source of electricity, substituting natural gas in some cases 
because the price of natural gas in 2021 has been unstable and has rose and uh, risen um, steeply in some cases. So we see that energy security concerns in this case has uh, had overcome uh, environmental and pollution ones, which caused the drop in previous years. Let's move to uh, the trade side. And um, OECD this time is the biggest exporter of uh, uh, coal, thanks to Australia mostly, but also the United States. However, uh, looking at countries singularly, we see that Indonesia is the biggest afford exporter. They increased the export by far in uh, the 2000s to surpass Australia in 2010, and then a bit of up and down, and now again in the first uh, position. And an important takeaway from this graph is that similar to what we saw for production and consumption, it is a handful of countries which accounts for the vast majority of exports. Finally, looking at the coal sector, we uh, talk about imports and OECD is as an aggregate, the main importer, thanks to two uh, important players, which are Japan and uh, uh, Korea. However, in terms of single countries, we have again that China and India are uh, the biggest importers. As we saw, they were also the biggest producer, but as well the biggest consumer. So they need to import some of the coal to meet their uh, internal demand. Also European Union, it's a uh, significant importer of coal with uh, uh, Germany, whose imports increased by 30% in uh, the last year. Now that we finished about this introduction about coal trends, let's look at the key concepts in terms of definition and coal balance. First of all, the product classification. So primary coal products can be distinguished and classified by their physical and chemical characteristics, as for example, the carbon content, but also the levels of moisture, volatile matter, and so on. And obviously these characteristics determines the price and the suitabilities for certain uses. On the left, you have a, a classification based on these physical and chemical characteristics, and it distinguishes between hard coal and brown coal. In hard coal, we have cooking coal, anthracite, and other bituminous coal, whether brown coal comprises subbituminous coal and lignite. And the difference between these two, it's often, uh, let's say, uh, recapped by the calorific value, which is higher than 24,000 kilojoule per kilogram for hard coal and below 24,000 for uh, brown coal. However, on the left side, you can see that also the different type of coals can be classified by their use. In particular, cooking coal, it's also called metallurgical coal because it's mostly used in iron and uh, steel industry, both in the transformation processes in coke ovens, but also uh, downstream to power all the final consumption activities of the industry. Then we have uh, anthracite, other bituminous coal, and subbituminous coal, which are called steam coal because they use its prevalent for electricity and heat generation, especially other bituminous coal. And finally, we have lignite, that is uh, the one with the lowest calorific value, also the cheapest uh, of these coals, and as well, it's often used for electricity and heat generation. Until now, I talked only about coal, but actually in uh, this presentation and also in our questionnaire, we collect data on the broader concept of solid fossil fuels and manufactured gases. So here you have a more comprehensive list of all the products we consider. And on the left side, we have the five types of coal we saw before, and also other two uh, energy products, which are oil shale and peat. Oil shale is a sedimentary rock uh, from which you can extract uh, oil, whether uh, peat is a sort of brown deposit, which resembles soil, and it's formed by the decomposition and accumulation of vegetable or organic matter. Now, all these products on this left, uh, so in blue, in the blue box, are primary products because they can be harnessed from the uh, biosphere, from the nature, let's say, whereas on the right side, in the light green and in the darker green um, boxes, you have derived secondary products and manufactured gases which have to be indeed manufactured or transformed 
from primary products. Here, a very comprehensive slide with the sum of the definition of these products. You have also this definition in the documentation of our uh, data uh, database product online on our website of void energy statistics and void energy balances. I will not go through all of this. You can read them at home, obviously, but I want to highlight here what are the interconnection that we can see between cold products. So let me take again the laser pointer. You see that in the first column, you have the seven products that we saw before, and then again, secondary products here and manufacturer gases here. So let's try to follow what is um, the evolution of cooking coal use and in which secondary products it can be transformed. So we have cooking coal, which is used in coke ovens in the iron and steel industry, and uh, its transformation um, as outcome as coke oven coke, coal tar, and coke oven gas. Coke oven coke, then again, can be used in blast furnaces to produce pig iron, which is not an energy product, but as a, as a byproduct of this process, we have blast furnace gas. So it's very important to know also this interconnection, also to check the quality of uh, our data. For example, if we know that cooking coal input to coke oven is as decreased in some year, we would expect also that the outcomes, so coke oven coke production, coal tar production, and coke oven gas production has decreased by a similar um, rate. Now let's look at the coal balance and what activities it includes. This is a simplified flow chart and you start reading it from the left where you have the supply side and then we go on the demand one. First of all, you have production which comes from mines or for derived coal products from transformation processes of primary products. And then you have also production from other sources which is some very uh, specific case where coal can be uh, derived some types of coal from waste piles, but also from uh, uh, other products. Uh, so other questionnaires, uh, there are some particular cases. Um, after production, we have trade, we have seen that, and then stock building and stock drawing. And then we go on the demand side where you have transformation of primary products into secondary coal products. You have energy industry on use, that it's when some coal products is used within an energy industry process to supply the energy needs for this process. Then total final consumption uh, in energy, uh, so in industry transport and other sectors, and also non-energy use, so use of coal as feedstock. And finally, distribution losses, which are more common for manufactured gases. So let's move to the first item of the supply side, and which is production, which can happen from underground, from surface mines, uh, which are most common, and as we said before, from other sources, but that's very peculiar and a uh, few cases. Now, uh, the important thing here to highlight is that the quantity reported in production has to be the one that it's already cleaned and already a marketable uh, product. So after all the operation of removal, for example, of inert matter and any other type of, uh, um, of small things. Um, another thing to remember is that in production, we include also the quantity consumed by the producer in the production process, which means, for example, to uh, power the equipment in, uh, in mines. And this is because this amount will be then reported on the demand side in energy industry on use in coal mines. So we have also to report them on the supply in order to balance them out. Moving to trade, coal is indeed a very tradable product because it's easily transported over long distances, either by ships and by trains. And it's important to set the boundaries in terms of energy statistics for imports and exports. So imports are the quantity of coal which enter the country for domestic use, whether export are the, is the coal which is domestically produced and then leave the countries and should be the reported by the country that is using it um, internally. This means that transit trade is excluded. You have here below three uh, scenarios that try to uh, simplify or just to show some of the possibilities which are okay or 
uh, not so okay, let's say. Uh, A and B are a situation where uh, we are fine, um, uh, in particular for country B, if production is big and the export, then it's likely that the export will come from production. For country C, we have some problems we, because we don't have any production, but we have imports and export. So it is likely to be transit trade. However, there are exceptions that we consider and it involves stock change in previous years that then are depleted in uh, later years for export or quantities of imported calls which undergo some treatments. So in general, uh, what is our recommendation is to collect all the information possible, uh, not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively on the provenience and uh, the usage of this call. And then uh, also with our help or, or with the following the recommendations, you can uh, decide whether include or exclude these questionable amounts. Moving to the demand side, there is a wide variety of transformation plans and processes. So first one, very known one, uh, transforms coal into electricity and heat, and it's the use of coal into power plants. Then we have also transformation of coal into coal products, which happen in coke ovens, in blast furnaces, and in gas works uh, plants, which produce flammable gas from coal and coal products. And then you have also uh, coal liquefaction plants, which transform some type of coal into liquid hydrocarbons. Let's look more in details at some of these transformation uh, processes. And the first and more common example is the use of coal in electricity and heat pan, uh, plants to produce obviously electricity and heat. The average efficiency is 37% uh, worldwide. And uh, it's important to know that because this is a reference for some quality checks that we can do on our data. So it's always important to calculate this efficiency obviously as output divided by input in energy unit and see whether we are uh, there. Obviously there are different ranges, whether we are producing only heat or combined heat and power. Another important example is the one in Kokoven where uh, you have a process of carbonization uh, of cooking coal, which is heated at high temperatures in an oxygen free atmosphere. So it's transformed, the main output is cocoa and coke, but there are also some byproducts which are cocoa and gas and coal tar. And the efficiency of this process is generally very high between 70 and 90%. And again, how to check that all the statistics collected um, are, are okay, are good enough. Again, trying to calculate the efficiency, uh, dividing the, all the outputs products divided by the, the input in energy units. Now, let's zoom out and have a look at the general picture of the iron and steel sector, because this is very relevant in the coal balance. It involves several processes on the demand side, and it's important to differentiate and classify the use of coal products into these different processes correctly. Transformation inputs uh, are highlighted in the darker blue arrows. So we have uh, cooking coal used in coke ovens, cocoa and coke using blast furnaces, but also sometimes uh, bituminous coal used in blast furnaces through a method called pulverized coal injection, which improves blast furnace performances and reduces also the cost. Then you have some quantities of uh, uh, the derived byproducts. For example, you see them at the top, cocoa and gas, blast furnace gas, and oxygen steel furnace gas that I will explain briefly uh, later on. But anyway, these gases can be obviously collected and then reused in uh, coke ovens and blast furnaces to provide energy to these processes. You see that in light blue, their reporting will be in energies to the industry on use. And then you have also some processes which happen downstream, which involves generally non-energy products. And in that case, still they will need uh, energy to be to be uh, um, driven. And so also some coal products can be used there to provide energy and that will be final consumption in iron and steel industry. So um, in the black arrows uh, or uh, from the black arrows, you will see energy products. Some other here are not energy products as iron ore and pig iron. 
And uh, here you have some efficiency that help you in uh, checking the quality of uh, your data and also the uh, classification for iron and steel industry processes according to international standard for industrial classification. Now that we dealt with the coal products classification and the elements of the balance, let's see how this knowledge is turned into data and statistics at the IA with your collaboration. In particular, in particular sorry, we will have a look at the data collection and validation in the joint IA at Eurostat annual questionnaires. Uh, first of all, data collection uh, can come from different sources. There are surveys given to companies and enterprises, which generally will have a precise accounting of the coal that they produce or that they purchase for, uh, for some of the uses, industrial uses for power plants and so on. Then you will have also surveys to uh, households in order to understand more in details what is the final use of coal, even though for coal there are not many uh, different choices other than um, eating and cooking actually as final uses. Then administrative data, which are generally collected non for, uh, for non-statistical purposes, as for example, to check whether the implementation of a certain policies is going into the right direction. An example of this trader, of this uh, data, very no one is trade data that are collected by the customs office. You can have direct measurements. You can have data from uh, other sources, national, or international, or school association. And finally, in case you are not able to collect some data, there is also the possibility to estimate or model them. As for example, if you are not able to collect the blast furnace gas production, you could estimate that uh, following peak iron uh, production or the input of cocoa and coke into the, the blast furnace. Um, you see here many examples. That's just to uh, show you that um, data collection is really a recollection, excuse me for the repetition, but a, a recollection of information from several different sources with supply and demand data, which rarely come from the same source. So uh, this is why uh, it is possible that data do, do not match on the supply and demand that you can have statistical differences. Now, a look at the IEA, uh, IEA questionnaire. Um, you have four main tables, the flow tables, which have uh, singular commodity balances of uh, every product um, one by one, one next to each other, and then uh, all the flows in the row dimension. We will see that more in details in a moment. Then you have imports and export uh, tables, and then you have the calorific value table, which is uh, uh, very important. And uh, it's for every product, but the one that are already collected in uh, um, energy units, as, as it is the case of manufactured gases. Then we have also additional 17 products tables, so one for each product, where you have basically all of these four tables that we saw before, one after the others, and with the time series. So very important. First of all, the flow table. Um, as you can see here, let me use also the pointer. Each column is the commodity balance of a product, and each row is a flow. So it's an origin or a use of uh, a, a certain uh, product. You see here the, this, uh, the supply block. So then you have transformation, final consumption, and so on. You see uh, the cells in uh, uh, yellow. This is a particular formatting of our questionnaire and shows all the values that are different than the pre-filled values. So that can be either the inputs for the current years, which were zero in the pre-filled uh, questionnaire, or the revisions for previous years. This is um, imports by sorts and export by destination tables. And I want to show you just something here. Um, in case you don't know what is, or we don't know what is the imports and the exports uh, for some quantities of coal, there is a row called not elsewhere specified where we can put the, uh, the amount that are left, let's say. Finally, very, very important, the calorific value table where you have different uh, uh, calorific value for each flow. Let me zoom and show you 
other bituminous code example, which is very interesting because you see that there is a certain calorific value for production. And then uh, it's the same calorific value for export. So we can already deduce from this table that uh, export come from uh, the production, the quantity of coal produced domestically by the country. And then you have a different calorific value for imports, which is the weighted average of all the imports from the different countries. And um, final uses will come mostly from uh, these imported uh, quantities. Um, here, this is one example of a table of a single product. And to highlight here is that you have the time series in this, uh, in this format. So you can see the evolution of uh, uh, the data over time. Finally, you have also the remarks page, which is very important, especially for us, because here you can provide additional information about complicated processes or specific si situation which apply to your country. And finally, another small thing to show you is the check data button in the menu uh, worksheet. Uh, by clicking that and selecting the year, you can run some uh, simple but also fundamental arithmetical and consistency uh, checks within the questionnaire. Now, we saw that consistency is very important in the questionnaire, but also with the other uh, questionnaire in general with the reporting of statistics for other fuels. So there are many things to check. For example, the efficiencies in the iron and steel industry transformation processes and some other, uh, some other um, let's say, uh, consistency between table imports and export in table two and three with table one, and also with other questionnaire, for example, the inputs to electricity and heat uh, power plants. This is a quick example. Let me let me go quickly over this because we are at the end of the presentation. But this is an example of how the data between the coal and the electricity questionnaire do not match. So let me magnify this. The quantity in uh, kilotons, so in physical unit, matches between the two questionnaires. But then the quantity in energy, so the fuel input in terajoule, uh, will not match if we multiply the physical unit in the coal questionnaire by the calorific value. So there is a difference in the fuel input in terajoule between the two questionnaires, which will lead also to a difference in the efficiency of uh, uh, this power plant, because here we are depicting uh, a process of a main activity producer electricity. So when the data do not match, then it's important to, um, uh, let's say, question, uh, question this data and see how you can uh, make consistency between the two different fuels. To conclude, if you learn, want to learn more about uh, IA energy statistics, we provide the manual uh, for free, obviously, on uh, our website, but there is also you can also find the United Nations International Recommendation for Energy Statistics, which is the uh, let's say general, uh, which gives the general guidelines for energy statistics uh, reporting. And also on our website, you can find specific uh, information about the cold questionnaire that I show you with a template of the questionnaire and the reporting instruction. And finally, an overview of the vast amount of data sets that we produce, some for purchase, but the vast majority is uh, for free on our website. And all uh, the energy statistics that we collect, uh, you see that on the right side, feed the many, the many analysis and reports that the agency makes and that are available for free on the website. So thank you very much. Um, let me keep uh, this. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, it's now time for questions. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nicola, for uh, the, the comprehensive presentation you've, uh, you've just made. Um, I'm looking in the chat and I don't see any particular questions uh, that have been raised at the moment, but I, I would encourage people to uh, to ask questions uh, either in the chat now or by raising your hand, or of course you can send them by uh, email after uh, the event. Uh, we do have a few minutes for, uh, for questions, um, and since uh, I say I, I don't see any at the moment, 
uh, maybe uh, I could take the liberty of, uh, of asking you a, a, a question, Nicola. Uh, you have uh, been dealing with uh, coal uh, statistics for, for quite some time uh, now at, at the agency. What are the, the key issues you find when uh, when receiving questionnaires from from colleagues? What are some of the typical errors you 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 find, and you would like? Uh, countries to, to improve on when they are uh, uh, submitting data to us. Thank you very much, Julian. Indeed, there are uh, some, some points that uh, we can stress. And I think uh, this slide, it's interesting, but also the slide about, for example, Cocoven efficiency. Um, uh, I can show that uh, in a moment. So I think that it's important to see the interconnection between primary and secondary products in the cold questionnaire. So if you have a, an input of a primary product in a transformation process, then you need also to have an output. And this the ratio between output and input has to respect more or less a range of efficiency that, for example, we give as indication in the reporting instruction. So I think that's, uh, that's something, obviously, it's, sometimes it's difficult to collect uh, some of uh, the uh, the outcome of transformation processes, uh, for example, in terms of gases. But it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's really important to recognize what are the interconnections because these are very useful to check the quality of, uh, of your data. For example, in Cocovens, very important to know that the efficiency is between 70 and 90% and has to be, has to be that. So uh, when we collect all the statistics on the outcome, and we know the input we can uh, we can check, or we could estimate either the input or the output if we have certainty about one of the two, but we are not able to collect the others. And uh, if you let me, I think it's another important point. It's about uh, uh, trade of coal. Here it's production and trade. So it's really important here to uh, exclude transit trade. So really to know what is the destination of the coal, which is imported by a country for domestic use or not. And uh, well, on the exporting side, I think it's not always easy to, to know whether the coal that you are exporting is ending in the final destination countries or not. But it's important, at least for the custom office uh, or for actually the statistician uh, dealing with the statistics from the custom office to know what are the definition in, uh, in energy statistics.